So let's dive into the Word of God together this morning. We're in this sermon series titled Redeemed, and we're, we're wrapping it up this morning. We've been here for a few weeks just talking about what it looks like to have a Redeemer, and all of this points to Jesus Christ. We've talked about it. We've got four chapters, 85 verses, and 23 times the word in one form or another of redeemed is used. The entire book is pointing to the redemption of Jesus Christ, just like our lives are supposed to be pointing to the Redeemer. All of our lives are just like the book of Ruth in that very simple, simple way. I've titled this week's sermon, God Has the Plan. And oh yes, he does have the plan. Thank you, Jesus. How, how many of you at one point have said, I, I got a great idea. I've got the plan. I've got it figured out. Am I the only one that's ever figured out something and then it crashes and burns? Yeah, I'll use myself as an example. We, I was building a house for us years ago and we didn't have a place to put our stuff. And so I thought, you know what? The logical thing to do would be to rent a storage unit, put our stuff into there. And then when I'm done building, we could just move it right in. I'm like, that's a waste of money. I'll build a shop that's smaller, we can put all of our stuff in there, and then when we finish, we'll just move the shop to our property. That was my plan, great plan. So we put all of our stuff in the shop that I built, and then we finished building the house, and so I go move all of our stuff, and guess what didn't come with us? The shop. Now that shop is somebody's really nice chicken coop. So that was my plan, right, to bring it with us and so we could use it later, but my plan failed because it, it was too heavy to move. So we never did end up getting to move it because my plan wasn't God's plan. So the chickens are very, very happy because of the nice house that they've been built. So I blew a bunch of money and I realized that my plans always are not God's plans. And you know what? I don't really even like my plans anymore. I've come to that point in my life where I'm like, here you go, Lord. I want your plans. I want your way. I want what you want because mine becomes a chicken coop. And I don't want that anymore. I want what you want. So grant me the desires of my heart that you have given to me. I want to know what God wants. Because I know one thing we only see in part, every one of us here. I look at Isaiah 55, for my thoughts are not your thoughts and your ways are not my ways, declares the Lord. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so my ways, God says, are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. He says, your plans are just that. They're yours. And you don't see the whole picture, but God does. And God knows exactly what it is that you need. So we need to know something today with confidence that there's something greater than us that's orchestrating events. There's something so much greater than us lining things up. And his name is Jesus Christ. So what we've got to do is we've got to wrestle with this idea of can I really trust him? Is he trustworthy? See, for me, oh, I'll say yes all day long. But I need you to say yes all day long. I need you to wrestle with the fact is, how can I learn to trust God? See, because in our fallen nature, we want to fight trusting him because we want to have it our way. We're like Burger King. We always want it our way. But that's not how he's designed us. He's designed us to want his way. And so we need to get back to that. And I want us to answer this question, how can I learn to trust God's plan? And, and it's going to be answered for us in part today from Ruth chapter 4. We'll be in 13 through 22 here shortly. I just want to set the stage about where we pick up the text at the end of this glorious book called Ruth. We know that in the very beginning of this book, we, we meet this guy named Elimelech. He was, a, he was an Israelite who was caught up in a bad famine and a drought. So he took his family and they went to Moab where they shouldn't have gone. He should have stayed put, but he didn't. And he dies. In the meantime, he's got two sons. So dad's dead. The two sons marry some local girls, some local Moabites. And, and all is well and six o'clock, everything's good. And then they both die. So now you've got a mom who's widowed with two young ladies that are now widowed as well. It's a mess, right? It's a mess. One of them goes back to Moab. We know Ruth, who's the star of the show today. Uh, she goes back to Bethlehem. She says what? Your people will be my people. Even more so than that, your God will be my God. She gave her heart to Yahweh. And she says, wherever, however, whenever, whatever, I'm yours. 
So she does that, and God supernaturally lines up what we would consider to be happenstance events, right? She goes to work and just so happens to be in the perfect field with this awesome guy who's got a lot of money and actually likes her and can provide for her because he's a redeemer, and God just so happened to move in his heart. God just so happened to give Naomi this idea that she had to go, that the daughter had to go sit at the feet of Boaz and, and propose to him in marriage scandal, right? Crazy. All these things are happening, and then he makes a promise. Boaz makes a promise to this young Ruth. He says, I'm going to redeem you, and if I can't, I'll find you somebody who can. And then we find out he does redeem her. He makes an opportunity to the guy that's closer in line to the family to be her husband and to get all the land. But he says, no, that's going to screw up my plans. Mr. So-and-so is his name. He's nameless because he's really irrelevant to the story. All we know is that his plans were more important than God's plans. But see, what God's plans did is they superseded even his selfish heart because God had already lined up that Boaz would be the redeemer, that Boaz would be the kinsman redeemer who brought forth the line of King David. So that's what we pick up today with a man saying, I'm going to be yours, you're going to be mine, and all is going to be well. We look in verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth. She became his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Then we get the genealogy of David tied in at the end of Ruth here. Now these are the generation of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. AKA, God has the plan. So Jesus, we pray over this text right now. And I ask, as I always do, that you would make it make sense. We're 3,000 years from this this event. and, And God, I pray that as we sit here today, that we would have full understanding. And that's by the power of your Holy Spirit. We'd have full understanding to know what it is that you're trying to reveal to us. So please open our eyes, open our ears to to see, to hear your divine message this morning. God, I'm going to do my best to get out of your way. I'm going to do my best to just let your Holy Spirit move in the hearts of the people that you have given to us this morning to journey with. And all of this, God, I keep saying it, but I mean it, is for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's just dive right in. It's fascinating to me in this book of Ruth. It starts with three funerals and ends with a marriage, ends with a a beautiful ceremony. Only God could make this perfect sandwich that we're about to, to unpack. And you know, when I see that, we got three, three funerals and a wedding. What do I see in there? I, I see God's redemptive plan. So we can look at our own lives. It starts out this way, and then God brings us here. And in the middle of that, all of life happens. And if you trust that God has the plan, it's going to go a lot better for you. I promise you. I promise you that. See, I, if we're honest, none of us would have picked the plan that we're, that the life that we're living. None of us would have picked that. Maybe you like how your life is turning out. That's awesome. But if you go back 10, 20, 30 years, would you have picked what you're doing right now? My guess is you had a different plan in mind. You had a different trajectory on where you wanted to go. And sometimes I picture God like, oh, that's cute, right? Like, oh, that was your idea. I really like that. Uh, Here's here's what's really going to go on. And so all we're being asked to do is to trust that God has the plan. And and I I wouldn't change my life for a second. You know that? I wouldn't change any part of it. Bless going in. Bless going out. Did I design this? No. No, I didn't pick most of it. He did. But I get to thrive within that. Just like Ruth is, just like Boaz is. We see in 13, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. We've clearly established through the book of Ruth that Boaz is a man of integrity. Boaz under promises, he over delivers. Boaz is a man of his word. Boaz says it, it's going to happen. We know that. He's proved that over and over. And here we have them getting married just like he said they would. Guess who the story's not even about? It's not about Boaz. It's not about Ruth. It's not about Naomi. It's about God. It's about what he's doing. 
Oh, there's some characters, just like we're the characters in our own little play that we call life. But it's ultimately about him. Our entire life is about what we can do for him and how we can serve him. God is the star of this story. So, he, so it says that Boaz went into her and the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. This is an Old Testament euphemism. This is a polite way to say that they consummated the marriage. It's just how they spoke back in the Old Testament. And she bore him a son after the Lord gave her conception. That's just a profound statement right there. I, I, I don't want to pass over this profound statement that the Lord gave her conception. So when your kid asks you about where babies come from, when your nieces or nephew asks you, where did babies come from? You don't need to get in the weeds too fast. You can just go back to Ruth 4.13 right here. Here's where babies come from. And the Lord gave her conception. That's where they come from. Ultimately, it is the Lord who brings, up, brings forth conception or does not. So we just go back to the Bible to answer the questions of our kids. So the Lord did give her conception and she bore a son. Do you realize how big of a gracious gift this was? She was married to Malon for maybe up to 10 years and didn't conceive. Oh, what's that all about? Well, that wasn't God's plan, now was it? It wasn't God's plan that she would have the child of Malon. It was God's plan that she would have the child of Boaz because he knew what he was doing. Can you see where I'm going with this? In your life, when you're like, 10 years I've been trying and I've got no baby. 10 years I've been waiting and this hasn't happened. I've been waiting for a spouse. I've been waiting for a job. I've been waiting for whatever that is. Can you trust that God knows what he's doing? Because God graciously gave her conception when he wanted to. Because God has the plan. That is the miracle that is before us. Some of you here have dealt with not being able to have kids. I can only empathize with the process being super frustrating, disheartening, discouraging, pretty hard. Some of you here, uh, myself included, have dealt with miscarriage and, and what that's like for the mom and how hard it is to lose a baby that you've been given. My heart aches for those of you moms who have gone through that. And there's not a really good answer, is there? We can give all nice pat answers on this side, that on this side of heaven, God knows what he's doing, which is very true, but we still have to feel the pain. We still have to understand that God's gracious gift sometimes is a child, and sometimes it's not a child. But as long as we go back to the idea and the promise that God has the plan and we need to learn to trust him in that, life is going to go much, much better. And you know what? It doesn't always end like this. I love the book of Ruth. There's no enemies in it. There's no evil there's no bad guys. I mean, there's a little bit of selfishness coming in and out, right? But honestly, she gets the guy. She gets the house. She gets the baby. It's like a Hallmark movie in the Bible, right? This is fantastic. And guess what? That's not your story. That was hers. So we don't compare our story to Ruth's. You don't compare your story to mine. I don't compare my story to yours. Why? My story was written by Jesus, the author and perfecter of my faith as is yours. Her story ends this way. And God knew what he was doing because he was bringing forward the line of King David and out of that, Jesus would come. So if you trust God that he has the plan, all of this other stuff that you're going through, it's not that big of a deal because we can trust him because he knows what he's doing. And I don't know what you're going through right now. I know some of you very personally, but I, I can't say that I know everything that you're going through. So whatever that is, if it's health issues, you got work issues, you got marriage issues, you got children issues, you got brokenness, financial challenges, you got business issues, I don't know what you're going through, but can you go back to the fact that God knows what he's doing and that he works out everything for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose? Can we go back to that regardless of what's going on? I want us to answer this question, how can I trust God's plan? How can I trust God's plan? It's right here. It's reflecting on his grace. Slow down. Take some time. Grab a journal and just reflect on this grace, this idea of this undeserved, overwhelming gift that Jesus bestows upon you. You did nothing to deserve it. You deserve hell and damnation. And in his grace, in his forbearance, he sought to elect you, to save you, to choose you to be one of his kids. And you say what? Thank you. I'm going I'm to receive that grace, and I'm going to reflect on that grace, because when we reflect on that grace, it causes our hearts to trust him. When we remember that he's working everything out, I'm the alpha and the omega, I'm the beginning and the end, and I have everything in between this figured out, why don't you trust me? 
And would you agree with me trusting is a process? Okay. Would you also agree with me that Jesus really never lets you down? Even if you've gone through hardships, things that you don't like, things that have been very difficult, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. He's always, always there. So by reflecting on his grace, it gives us an opportunity to, to just think about forgiveness and mercy and compassion and his provisions and his gift of salvation. I think that if we reflect on his grace more, we can have a different perspective on life. I love how my, one of my heroes of the faith, Charles Spurgeon, he says this when he was reflecting on God's grace. He said, the grace that does not change my life will not save my soul. That grace needs us thinking. That grace needs us sitting. That grace needs us reflecting. Because the grace that he brings saves our soul. All right, so babies come from God. We've established that, right? We've got to reflect on the grace that Christ brings. And, and God chose Ruth to be the mom of this baby. God chose Boaz to be the, the dad of this baby that we're going we're gonna to read about. Because God has something so much greater than what we can see or what they can see. So much more. This is way more than a love story. Verse 14, the women now, they come to Naomi, right? They come to, they come to her and they say, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a Redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. Oh, how the tunes have changed, right? We had negative Naomi in the beginning. And she's like, don't call me Naomi. I'm all, you can call me Mara because I'm so bitter. And they're like, oh, Naomi's back, right? We got all this going on. And now they're doing nothing but praising God. Do you know why? Because God was moving. And they found reason to praise. And guess what? They weren't jelly. They weren't jealous of her. They weren't jealous that everything is working out good for her. They were excited. So let's flip, this, let's flip that mirror right over. Are you excited when God blesses the socks off of other people? Or do you got that little bit of jelly where you're like, mm, why me? Why not me? Why did they get that? Why did they get the kids? Why did they get the money? Why did they get this? Why did they get this? Or are we like, God, what are you? that's amazing. I'm so excited for what you're doing into their life right now. God, your spirit is moving. You're redeeming people. You're saving people through that church, through that family, through those people. Right? We need to be starting to, to change this idea. And, and part of this, you understand, is for us learning to trust God. So as we're learning to trust God, it's very simple. We rejoice in the success of others. Because when we rejoice in the success of others, we're no longer focused on ourselves. We're watching God do what only God can do. So when we rejoice about what, the, what they're going through and what God is doing, we learn to trust Him more. Proof that God is moving in their lives. I led, de I led devotions this week, we have a, a staff and key volunteer meeting, and, and I was talking about the fact that our life needs to be about determination, finishing strong, you know, all that good, good stuff. And I did some research this week on long-distance running because I was teaching about determination. I am not a long-distance runner by any stretch of the imagination. I was not that cross-country guy in high school. I am still not that cross-country guy in my mid-40s, okay? But I know this much. They need, they need a few things to finish a race strong. So a long-distance runner needs a few things. They need, they need determination, right? they got to have it made up in their mind that they're going to finish that race. They need physical aptitude. They've got to be trained. They've got to have the right shoes. They've got to have the right coach. They've got to have the right supplements. All of these things have to happen. But do you know one of the most important things for a runner to finish strong is? To be cheered on from others. To be cheered on from the sidelines saying, you can do it. You're doing a good job. Keep it up. I know you're tired. I know it hurts, but I need you to finish. Do you think that we can start being each other's cheerleaders a little bit more? Encouraging each other to finish strong. Rejoicing when God is moving in each other's lives. Saying, you can do it. God is good. Keep going. We need to start being each other's cheerleaders far more than each other's critics. And it takes us reflecting on the grace of Christ. It takes us rejoicing when God is moving in your life for us to actually be a cheerleader and not a critic. So we got all these town ladies who were the gossips. They were the one that were like, mm-hmm, and now they're the cheerleaders because they're seeing what? They're seeing God move. May we be more like these ladies in the latter part of this book. They said, the Lord has not left you this day. They were like, God promised you that he was going to be with you. God promised you that, and we believe it. You remember Naomi? She thought God's hand was literally against her, right? Her perspective, she was broken. She was hurting. She was isolated. And then look at what God did. He says, I know what you need, child. 
God is telling you today, I know what you need, child. I am your father, and I am a good, good father, giving good gifts to those whom I love. He knows what we need, so do not get so despaired. Don't get so angry. Don't get so frustrated. Don't get so depressed. Remember that God has a plan. It'll change your perspective. It'll change your heart. Remember the grace of Christ. Rejoice when God moves in other people's lives. The women were, they were stoked on what God was doing. They're like, Yahweh is moving. Yahweh is keeping his promises. And they were excited. And then they said, blessed be the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer. And may he be famous in Israel. They're blessing. They're pouring on blessing. And I just love it because God has not abandoned her. And I don't know where you're at today, but I'm telling you right now, God has not abandoned you. If there is an unanswered prayer that you have, if there's something that's hanging out there, I'm telling you right now, God has not abandoned you. He is right there with you. You don't see it yet. I get it. We only see in part. We think we got this great plan, and it's kind of fumbling before our eyes. And God's like, I need you to trust me. I know what I'm doing. I've been doing it for years, and I got you covered. She says, and may you this day be without, don't be without a redeemer. Who's this redeemer? Is she talking about Jesus? Is she being, are they being prophetic? No, no, they were talking about Obed. This baby is going to be their redeemer. You're like, how can a baby who's not Jesus be a redeemer? Because part of that baby's job was to provide for Naomi and for Ruth in their old age. So that he was able then to take that promise and take care of them. Do you see how God lines everything up? You cannot make this stuff up. This boy was going to be a blessing to Naomi because he shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. God is providing for them because he knows they're getting older. God is going to take care of them because he knows what they need. And God's timing is always perfect. Had she had a baby with Malon back in, back in um, Moab, thank you, all of this would have changed. This would not have been an opportunity. But God... But God, but God, he will always have his way. We'd be wise to submit to the sovereign leadership of God Almighty. So this child's going to help provide for them and their elder as they grow older. And this is, they were, she, was, she was learning how to trust God's plan too, just like we are. We're trying to figure this out. So we obviously, we reflect on his grace. We take time to sit back and be like, okay, I'm way too wound up. Jesus, I just need to just, for the next 20 minutes, I'm going to think about your grace. I'm going to think about what it means for me. Learn to trust him more. And then I'm going to rejoice, God, when you're doing good things in the lives of my brothers and my sisters here and around the world. I'm going to rejoice that that organization is being blessed. I'm going to rejoice in what you're doing because you're proving that you're trustworthy. And then I got to do what they did. Is I got to recognize God's hand in whatever it is. I got to recognize God's hand. See, I think we're pretty quick to take our own hand and pat ourselves on the back when things go good. And then we're really quick to take that same hand and point it at somebody else when things don't go exactly how we planned. Well, get rid of your own hands. Why don't we just reflect on God's hand and what he's doing? We get to recognize how God is supernaturally lining things up. Obviously, she had to go to work. She goes to the field. She goes and does a marriage proposal. She does all of those things. Great. Yeah, yeah. We have to do our part in the routine, in the mundane, in the everyday, just like she did. But ultimately, it's God's hand that gets all the glory for this. Not her, not Boaz, not Naomi, not the ladies. God is the one that gets the glory. So the sooner that we take our hearts and put it right there, and we stop making ourselves the bell of the ball, the most important one in the room, as soon as we go to this point, we're showing that we're trusting God's plan and not our own. We need to start meaning everything that we're praying about. Even when, if we really recognize God's hand in it, when you go to pray before your meal, are you sometimes like I was when I was a kid? Lord Jesus, bless his food and drink in Jesus' name, amen. Right? I knew that prayer. We'd spit it out every week. I wasn't thankful as a kid. You know what? Now, when I pray and I thank God for the food, I really believe that it was his hand that gave that provision. Did I have to cook it? Yeah, you bet. He gave me the gifts to cook it. So then I'm going to praise him for that. He provided the funds so that I could buy the food to make the food. Do we recognize God's hand in even the simplest of things? Because if we do, we're showing that we are trusting God's plan. We're becoming more like him in the process. They said, your daughter-in-law loves you. 
She is more to you than seven sons. And you've given birth to this boy. He's more to you than seven sons. Okay, there's a couple things going on. Historically, you have to understand, back in the day, sons were far more valuable than daughters. They provided for the family. They were the ones that the name, the lineage of the dad, grandpa, and everything, everything farther up the line went through the boy. This is how it was. So she's saying she loves you. She loves you, and she's worth more than seven sons. That means that she's priceless. This woman that God has given you is the perfect gift. This woman that God has given you is going to bring on this name. She's going to be able to be taken care of. She loves you. That word has been completely depleted in our culture. I love hot dogs. I love the, what were the stars in the sky? What was the, the light thing going on? Aurora lights. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I love this. I love, 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 love. I love puppies. It's not what we're talking about here. This ties us all the way back to the very beginning of Ruth. This idea of chesed, the kindness of God, this overwhelming love, sacrificial love of God. That's what she had for her mother-in-law. The honor that she showed this gracious woman is a model for all of us on how we love the women that God has brought into our lives. We show the same devotion that God shows us. We show the same forgiveness when they screw up and they don't do it just right. We show the same adoration because of who they are and they're gracious in the sight of God. That's how Ruth viewed Naomi. And the women recognized it. See, this wasn't lip service for her. She really did love her. She was going to spend the rest of her life serving her. And they recognized it. They're like, she's worth more than seven sons, which would be definitely a full quiver in the Old Testament. And she's got more value than that. See, just like God, Ruth placed Naomi's needs above her own. That's what she did. We're being called to this. It looks so much like Jesus to me. It looks so much like Jesus to outserve everybody around you, to put their needs first. Again, we like to be the bell of the ball. We like to be the most important person in the room. We're not called to that. We're not called to that at all. Love on display is what we're seeing here through Ruth. And then Naomi, verse 16, she took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. Now, there's all kinds of debates on what this actually means. So the best translation I could possibly give you from the original language is this little baby had her wrapped around his finger. She nursed him as if he was his, her own. She took care of Obed. He literally had her wrapped around his finger. And she was so happy. She was content. She was rejoicing. She was excited. She was, she was given new life. She thought everything was over. She thought she had no more hope. And then God not only gives her a daughter-in-law who's worth more than seven sons, she gives, she's been given a son-in-law who's going to take care of her with his son to her old age. And now, and now on top of that, she's been given a lineage, a genealogy, a baby where that name now gets passed on. She was beginning to see that God has the plan. I want you to look at your life right now. Just take a pause. Can you remember a time in your life where you just felt really empty and alone. Just think for a second. Was there a time in your life in the last X amount of years where you're just, you felt abandoned, you felt on an island, you felt isolated? Tracking, you got something? Okay. And then can, did that get solved? Did that find resolution? Did God fill you back up? We're told life is filled with hills and valleys. Top of the world, bottom, we get it, right? I need us to keep going back to this. So when we're isolated, when we're alone, when we're depressed, when we're frustrated because this isn't working and this didn't go right and this person didn't say this, this person did say this, when we're over there, God's going to bring resolution. You just got to trust his plan. He brought resolution to this family because he knew what he was doing. And it wasn't just for the love story. If that was all it was, it'd still be awesome. But it's so much more than that just like your lives. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for, to give you good and to prosper you, to give you welfare, not harm. He knows what he's doing. All he's asking us to do is to trust the plan as he's working it all out. 
God is teaching us even right now to reflect back and to trust him because he always brings resolution. So I want us to reflect on his grace. I want us to rejoice when God is moving in other people's lives. I want us to recognize God's hands. And then I'm going to go a little slang on you. I want you to remember that God's got you. It's easy to forget, but you got to remember that God's got you. Hebrews 13, 5, I already said it. I'll never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'm not going to bail on you. I got you says God. I don't know what you're going through today, but I can tell you this much. God's got you. He's got the plan. He knows what he's doing. All he's asking you to do is to not doubt his faithfulness, to not doubt his sovereignty, to not doubt his goodness. Even if you don't like how things are going right now, I need you to know that God is for you. And God's going to work it all out his way. And these village women, they weren't done yet. They're, they're excited, and they say in 17, and the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, a son has been no- born to Naomi. They named him Obed. As far as I know, this is the only time in the entire New Test- Old Testament where there was a group of women that had a part in naming somebody. I can't find any other examples. So this is a pretty special time, right? They're clearly involved in the life of Naomi, in the life of Ruth, in the life of Boaz. Um, and it doesn't mean that Ruth and Boaz had no say in it. Right? That's not what this means. But it does mean that it takes a village to raise a child. It does mean that they were all in this together. And for us today, it takes a church to raise godly kids. So we're in this together. Right? This is what it means for us. And we can take this and run because we're in community together, just like they were. We're doing this race together, just like they were. And they're so excited. A son has been born to Naomi. Obed would continue the lineage of Naomi and her deceased husband, her deceased son. That name didn't die. Very powerful way that God brings this all to conclusion. And and this whole book, the entire book points to this next line. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. The entire thing points right here. The revealing of the son born to, to Ruth and Boaz, this little boy named Obed. He was the grandpa of King David. Can you joke and imagine this? He's the grandpa of King David. Oh, wait a minute. There's scandal all the way through this, and yet God, in his sovereignty, in his supernatural ability to orchestrate events, makes this couple have this baby to be a part of the lineage of King David, swim upstream, lineage of Jesus. All right, it blows my mind. I don't know how else to use this in words. It's unbelievable that God can do this. You might read it and be like, yeah, duh. No, think about this. This is un... There are no statistics that could make this happen except for God. You, you got the disobedience of the young man that leaves his home. You, you, got a, you got he dies, the sons die. You've got them leaving, the, the, going back to Bethlehem. You've got all these things going on. They just so happen to go to this field where they, she's working and gleaning some things and just so happens to meet this guy who's like, hey, she's pretty cute. And then they come together and then the mom's like, hey, you should probably ask him to marry you. And then, so she does that. She goes to his feet. She asks him to marry him. And then voila, the other guy doesn't even want her. So he gets her. They have a baby and he's the grandpa of King David. Hello? That's nuts! God has the plan. This genealogy that we're given, the last few verses, I just want to point out one thing. I want you to look at this verse, verse 21. Salmon fathered Boaz, Boaz fathered Obed. How many of you are like me and you get to the genealogy part and you don't want to admit it out loud but you skip it? Am I the only one? <sighs> we can't be skipping this stuff. It's too good. It's too, every, oh, the word of God is God-breathed. It is without error. It is there for a reason. So what is the reason? Why do we have this genealogy? Is it just to prove some things? Well, there's some things in here that we got to grab. This guy named Salmon. Do you know who he was? Do you know who his wife was? It was Rahab, the prostitute. Oh, wait, wait, wait. There's scandal all the way through this. She protected these two Israelites that came in to spy out the land, and they meet her, right? And they're like, if you, do, if you put out the flag and we know who you are, we won't kill you like we do with everybody else. So Rahab, the prostitute, ends up marrying this guy. The lineage of Boaz is tied into this. Do you see how God's doing both sides of this? Impossible. I would say, impossible if God wasn't the one behind it. 
prostitute that has been redeemed. Obed's mom, Ruth, was an outsider who had been redeemed. God is the one that works out our crazy story, our brokenness, our sin, our shortcomings. He's the one that works it all out for his glory. And even farther up the line, you look at Perez in verse 18. He's the son of Judah and Tamar. Are you kidding me? More scandal. This whole thing is riddled with scandal. It'll be all over the National Enquirer. But God, God doesn't pick who we would pick. God doesn't do things how we would do things. I got a question for you. Do you think God can do great things through you? Every one of us in this room has a past. Every one of us, most likely, if we're completely honest, has things that we're not proud of. All of us have things that we would call marred. And God says, I know what I'm doing. I work out everything for the good of those who love me. I know who you are in Christ. I know who you were before me, but I know who you are, and I got your heart, and I need you to trust that I got the plan. Doesn't matter what craziness is going on or what's, what, what you're going through. We got to keep going back to the fact that God knows what he's doing, and he has the plan. Do you think that God can do and use you for great things? And this isn't even about you. I'm using this because we need to challenge ourselves that we want him star of the show. I got that. You got that? You with me? But do you believe it? Do you believe that God can use you to accomplish what it is that he wants to accomplish? And are you okay with that? What if your great things is hardship? God used the other redeemer to pull about this. His story doesn't end like this. We don't even know his name, Mr. So-and-so. But God used him to accomplish his purposes. It doesn't mean that we always get the girl. It doesn't mean we always get the baby. It doesn't mean we always get the job. But are you okay with God doing what he wants to do in and through your lives? Do you trust him that much that his plan is better than yours? We bring all this together. This book has been really uh, life-giving for me to study deeper. I I've really, really appreciated Ruth. And, and i got to tell you right now, we're 3,000 years removed from this story. But I'm telling you today, in 2024, time is running out for us. So we may be thousands of years removed from this, but I'm watching a bunch of events take place. That means that the curtain's about to get closing. And so we've got to be living our lives with this depth of trust so that whatever storms come our way, we are ready for Jesus to come back. So how do we get ready for Jesus to come back? It's, it's, it's us receiving his grace, right? Surrendering our life to him, surrendering what we want for what he wants. I was challenged this week with a question, and I want to read this same question to you. Thinking of Boaz, thinking of Ruth, have you put yourself at the feet of the Lord of the harvest? Have you placed yourself there, trusting him? Have you placed yourself at the feet of the Lord of the harvest? Until you do, God can never be to you all that he wants to be. He has so much more for you. And he's saying, I just need you to sit at my feet. I need you to surrender to me. So how can I learn to trust God's plan? You sit at his feet. You reflect on his grace. You rejoice in the success of others. You recognize God's hands. You remember that God's got you. And you just sit at his feet. That's it. He does everything else. You just got to go to him first, last, and everything in between. I want us to learn today that all we got to do is sit with him. All we got to do is follow him. All we got to do is trust him. My hope, my hope is that I get to spend eternity with each of you here today. Asking questions, hanging out, praising. And it ain't going to be like sitting on a cloud playing a harp. Are you kidding me? Who came up with that? We're going to be with Jesus forever. I want that for every one of you. I want to be with every one of you forever. And all we're required to do is surrender to him. That's it. That's it. Do you think that God can use you to do great things for him today? Do you trust that God has the plan? Amen? Jesus, we take this and we, we do exactly what we just said. We're going to sit it at your feet. We're going to put it right there. God, teach us, teach us how to do this better, would you please? Would you, would you show us what it means to fully surrender? Would you show us what it means to not want to be in the middle and the center of everything? Would you show us what it means to give up what we want to get what you want. 
God, I thank you for this text. I thank you for this series about what it looks like to have a Redeemer named Jesus. God, and I pray that our entire lives would be pointed towards that love, towards that plan, towards that promise. Jesus, thank you. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen.